Well, you all pull out all the stops when you uh, <laughs> figure out how to introduce somebody. I, I appreciate that. I'm not worthy of any of those things that have been said. And I've got such an amazing congregation, amazing eldership to work with. Uh, I'm truly blessed and honored to be with you today. And I, my prayer has been that uh, some good will come from the things that we talk about and uh, hopefully uh, maybe some little nuggets of uh, uh, some things might uh, spring, some ideas that will be beneficial uh, to the work here. We are talking about um, uh, leadership training uh, in this hour. And, uh, you know, as I thought about this topic and thought about how to start, you know, there are a number of books over the years that have been published that if they were to be published again today, would probably be not well received and very much out of date. Uh, I think about the 1955 edition of the Good Housewife's Guide. <laughs> I don't know that that would be well received today if it was published again. Uh, I think about the 1975 uh, edition of the IBM Word Processor User's Guide. Um, that has probably changed just a bit uh, over the last 50 years. Um, but one of my favorite books on leadership uh, was written by one of my favorite people uh, of all time, uh, Brother Wendell Winkler. He wrote a little book on leadership. The subtitle of that book is The Crisis of Our Time. The Crisis, leadership, the crisis of our time. I feel bad that Brother Winkler did not live long enough to come to a point to realize it's no longer a crisis today. That that book, if it were published again, would not be well received today because today, leadership in the church is no longer a crisis, right? <laughs> that book was published in 2003, The Crisis of Our Time. I don't know that that crisis has gone away. Here's these other books that we could say, you know, no, that's the, those, those no longer fit. Uh, what we're trying to do uh, in, in the, uh, you know, the, the housewife's guide or the IBM's guide, but here's a book that was written by this man with so much experience who said leadership that he saw it as the crisis of our time, and, and here we are 20 years later, and probably still quite a crisis. And as I think, as I think about that, I, I, I wonder what's, what has been the cause of that crisis, and any number of factors. Uh, we, we could contribute that we could say that these have been uh, a part of it. You know, part of that may be uh, that the church, uh, in, in some places, the church is not as large it used, as it used to be. Congregations are not as large uh, as some congregations used to be. And as a result, there are fewer men. And when you have fewer men, you've got fewer men who are ready to lead. And so part, part of it may just be a, a, a change in just the dynamic of number uh, of those who are in congregations, I, I think the devil has done uh, his job in, uh, in, in just creating the world to be uh, such a draw for young men uh, that they are so enamored by the things of this world, uh, by the pursuits of life, by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this world that how many of our young men have their sights on, I want to be a leader in the church, let alone I want to be a part of the Lord's church uh, in my future. And so Here's the devil that's been planting these seeds of, of uh, distraction, of causing them to go in, in different directions. Uh, and so, to me, one of the greatest needs uh, that we have in the church today are men who are willing, men who are qualified, men who are ready to lead. Um, but as you think about leadership training, I think that's maybe where our crisis is. Why, do we, why is leadership a crisis in the church, and I'm using that word crisis because it was titled Brother Wendell Winkler's book, um, and you may not think that leadership is a crisis in the Lord's church, and I'm talking in, a, in an overall broad sense, but if leadership is a crisis in the Lord's church, is it possible that it's because leadership training has been a crisis, that we have not done our job in training men to be leaders in the church? Um, I don't... I, the, the, the good thing about being an outsider and a visitor is I have no idea what you have done in training men. You, you, may, you may have done everything under the sun in order to train men uh, to be leaders, and, and I hope that to be the case. So I, I come in as a complete unknown as to what you have done, um, 
but I'm sure that there are things that every congregation could do to improve in training men to become leaders. I knew one elder, uh, knew him personally. He believed that, that men would develop themselves to become leaders. And so he was not, he was not interested in doing hands-on intentional leading. He, he, those were his words. His words were, elders will develop themselves. Uh, and, and perhaps he thought that because maybe that's how he thought uh, that he became an elder is that he had gone through that development process himself. And so if that's the mindset, if we're just waiting for men to develop themselves, then we're going to be waiting. Uh, we're going to be watching and, and hoping that these things come about. And we're going to be wishing, OK, hopefully these men are going to get on track and be what we want them to be sometime in the future. Uh, I think it was Brother Jerry Barber. Uh, who wrote and said that the eldership you have today is the eldership you plan to have 30 years ago. And I think that's an interesting concept. Because you think back, well, no, this isn't what we plan to have 30 years ago. Well, what did you plan to have 30 years ago? Whatever eldership you plan to have, what have you been doing to develop the eldership that you have today? And so not a bad concept to say, okay, whatever you have today is what you plan to have uh, some 30 years ago. And so if that's true in the church, if we need leadership training in the church, if we need men to come along and to mentor and to train others, don't we see that in all walks of life? Think about, think about athletes. Think about professional athletes. Think about Olympic athletes. How did they rise to the, to the stage where they are? You know, how did, uh, how did Peyton Manning become Peyton Manning? You know, how did, uh, how did Michael Jordan become Michael Jordan? Well, he just developed himself. Well, yes, that's part of it. But even Michael Jordan talked about the fact, he talked about uh, at Dean Smith over at North Carolina, and he said, he was my mentor. Uh, he, he, he talked about talked about Dean Smith. He said he was more than a coach. He was my mentor, my trainer, and my second father. And so when Michael Jordan was asked, what got you to the level where you are today? He pointed, at, he pointed back to a man. He said, it, it was this guy. He made a difference. When Peyton Manning was asked, how did you get to this level where you are today? He talked about his high school football coach. He talked about offensive coordinator at Tennessee. And said, it was those guys that pushed me and drove me and, and encouraged me. And so if that's the case just on a, an athletic level, what about in the church? Are we encouraging men? Are we training men? Are we helping men to become leaders? Or are we of the mindset well, they're, they're just going to kind of develop themselves. Um, one of the greatest, obviously, and this is an easy thing to, to think about and answer, one of the greatest developers of leaders in the church, second to Jesus, was the Apostle Paul. But I want you to get your Bibles. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to look at a couple verses here. Kind of use these, uh, these a couple verses in 2 Timothy chapter 3 sort of as our, uh, as our anchor just for the next couple minutes uh, to, to look at some thoughts. And as I, as I thought about... The Apostle Paul had thought about, okay, what passages could you use to talk about Paul uh, as, a, as a trainer of leaders? I mean, the flood of verses just starts coming. I mean, there's all sorts of verses uh, that, that we could look at to talk about Paul as a, as a trainer of leaders. But I want you to look at, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Obviously, right into Timothy, the second letter, nearing his death. And uh, in verse 10 is where I want us to pick up. Just look at verse 10 and, and part of verse 11. First part of verse 10, the New King James, Paul says to Timothy, but you have carefully followed. Now, the translations vary here. Uh, the, New, the, the King James is going to say that you fully, you have fully known. Uh, and so it's going to take that saying fully, carefully, it's gonna, but it's going to use the word known. Other translations, the ESV, New, New American Standard, just going to simply have the word follow. Um, so Timothy... And, and, and I like the New King James carefully follow because I think that's played out in the Greek word that's behind it. Because it is not simply, the word that's used here is not simply talking about you follow me. Great. Thank you for following me. Um, and and I, don't, I don't like to get into a lot of Greek words or show a lot of Greek words, but I am going to do this one just for this purpose. This particular Greek word is like many Greek words, compound word. Uh, it's got the Greek word akalutheo. You don't need to know that word to get into heaven, so don't worry about it. But it's got the Greek word akalutheo, which just, it, that's the word that means follow. So that's the simple verb that just means follow. Literally, it means we're going the same way. But it's got a prefix in front of it, and a, a lot of Greek words have this. It, it, it has a preposition tied to the front of it. Now, akalutheo, follow, that Greek
Greek word often has a number of different prefixes, a number of different prepositions put in front. Sometimes you'll read akluthel, but it'll put the Greek prefix ek, ek, in front of it, and that just means out of. And so that would literally mean you have followed me out to the end of where I've been leading. That would be a pretty cool concept to say, Timothy, you have followed me out to the end of where I've been leading. That, that'd, be, that'd be pretty good. Or sometimes that akluthel has the Greek preposition kata, which means down or after or behind. So that would just mean, okay, you were following but you were, you were following behind me. That's good, because that, that's where that's where a follower would need to be, right? Behind. Sometimes that Greek word, I believe that, oh, follow, sometimes has the Greek preposition soon, S-U-N, which just means with. Well, that would, that would be great. I mean, that would make sense. Okay, you're following, but you're following with me. So there's some camaraderie there. But I find it interesting, and, and I don't want to make more out of this than we should. I find it interesting he's got the Greek preposition Para, P-A-R-A. We get our word parallel from that. Not just following behind. Not just following the P is, is another one. Not just following over me and aware of it. And not just even following me out to the end. You have been para. You have been right here beside me. We have been going side by side. It's not that I treated you as an underling. I treated you right here side by side. And you have carefully followed along with me. You have been closely associated. Not you've been tagging along like a kid does way behind you when they don't want to be associated with you when you're the parent. It's, it is, you've been right there closely side by side. We couldn't have been closer in our association. Do we have people following us? Do you have somebody following you that closely to figure out how to be a leader? Side by side with you in step with you all the way through what you are doing and conforming themselves, and that's this idea of Padaka Akulatheo, conforming themselves to look exactly like you. So what I want to do for the next couple minutes, I want to use 2 Timothy chapter 3. I just want to look at some of these concepts that that I see in these two verses and see here are some traits, here are some qualities, here are some things that we need to do uh, in leadership training based upon what we're seeing here. First thing I see in these verses is that uh, leadership training involves personal and deliberate interaction. That elder who said, well, they'll just develop themselves. We're just kind of waiting and watching and wishing this happens. Uh, I, don't believe that's, I don't believe that's the concept of biblical training men to be leaders. This is spending time with the man. Spending one-on-one time with the man, talking to them, helping them to develop. And that's what's happening when Paul says, you have carefully followed me. They've been spending a lot of time together. They knew each other. Timothy knew Paul. Now think about the deliberate interaction between these two men. Timothy, likely a a convert of Paul. The, The Bible doesn't just say this is the case. But it says it is the case. You know, it's, he, he calls him his son in the faith. First Corinthians chapter four, verse seventeen calls him my my uh, my beloved and blessed son in the Lord. Uh, and so, likely likely a convert of Paul. But Paul didn't just baptize this young man. If he did baptize, he just didn't baptize this young man and say, "Great, so thankful that you're saved and you're a member of the church." I've got other things to do. Wish you well. He took the young man under his wing and trained him. When we have baptized somebody, when there's when there's a man who's just been converted, have we ever planted a seed of, you know, I'm so thankful for the decision that you've made. You know what? You ought to set your sights one day on being a deacon in the Lord's church. He may never be a deacon. He may never qualify to be a deacon. But at that moment when he is still wet, almost literally, but at that moment when his heart is on fire for the Lord to just plant an idea that says, you ought to set your sights on, fill in the blank, being a deacon of the church, becoming a preacher, whatever that may be, to plant that seed in a soil that is rich and ready for some kind of suggestion like that. Maybe that's what Paul did. Took a convert and said, I'm going to help make something out of you. Now, Timothy was a young man when this began. We don't know exactly how old. We've conjectured that he was perhaps a teenager uh, in Acts chapter 16 uh, when he begins following with Paul. Uh, But he he is definitely a young man who's following after Paul in, in his pursuits. 
How many young men do we plant that seed, that thought in? How many teenagers? We encourage our teenagers. We want there to be involved. We're going to talk about teens here in just a little while. But how many of those do we put a deliberate seed of thought in their minds to say, I hope you're setting your sights on being an elder, being a deacon, being a preacher one of these days. And not just the words, but the encouragement and, and the follow-through with that, which we're going to talk about. We've got uh, um, every Monday morning uh, at home, we have, a, we have an office meet. So every... Uh, all the office staff, all the preachers, we just have a 9.30, usually about a 15, 20 minute uh, just meeting. We have a short Bible study. What's going to be happening? You know, talk about what's happening this week. Just go over some, some things. We're all on the same page. 15, 20 minutes is, is generally all we're doing. Um, we've got, uh, we've got one, one individual who is our, uh, um, our operations manager who comes to those meetings. And he's got a little six-year-old boy. Um, who is uh, just an awesome little kid? But it was—it uh, must have been summertime, and so he was—he was with dad at work um, that uh, on that Monday morning. And uh, so at the end of end of these office meetings, we always have a prayer. Uh, and so I—I uh, uh, I don't remember how he ended up leading the prayer, but he vo he volunteers to lead a prayer. Uh, the kid just bought, and so uh, I think I said at the end of the meeting, okay, let, let's have a prayer. I think I was probably going to lead it. I said, okay, let, let's have a prayer as we close. And, and can I lead it? This little six-year-old boy with a bunch of old people in the room, right? Uh, can I lead the prayer? Well, absolutely, Lucas, you can lead the prayer. And, I mean, this kid led a prayer that would put a lot of us to shame. Uh, and, and, I mean, just a little six-year-old boy uh, just pouring his heart out, just as, as focused as he could be in that prayer. And after he prayed, a comment was made to that little boy, that was a great prayer. That's the kind of prayer that a preacher prays. And he took that little seed and he even said the next day, I think I might be a preacher. Because of a little seed, you know, that may that may not go anywhere. You know, that little seed may get thrown out at some point and, and go on. But a little, just a little comment, deliberate, personal in nature. And I'm not going to talk about all of these in that detail because we, we don't have time uh, to do that. But if you think about the relationship between Paul and Timothy, uh, Timothy was a regular travel companion of Paul, spent a lot of time with him. He was a dependable worker of Paul. Paul could, we'll talk about this more in a minute, but Paul could leave him uh, in various places uh, when, when he needed to, uh, to go, when Paul needed to go to other places. He was a trusted messenger. How often, and we'll see some of these in a few minutes, how often was Paul sending Timothy uh, on, uh, on a mission uh, to take messages? Timothy was a faithful co-worker of Paul. I find Paul's writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 19 interesting because he says in that verse that the gospel was preached by us. The gospel was preached by us. Uh, and then you've got a dash, at least in New King James, you've got a dash. And he mentions three people. The gospel was preached by us. Me, comma, Silas, and Timothy. How would you like to be included in a sentence? of preachers with the Apostle Paul. <laughs> we, the gospel has been preached by us. He, he doesn't say the Apostle Paul was... No, he includes Timothy in the list of guys who are going around preaching. What, is that, what does that indicate? He, there aren't levels of preachers. There are not big preachers and little preachers. The gospel has been preached by Paul and Timothy. Is there a difference? Yeah, one's an apostle, one's not. But they're preachers of the gospel. He was a faithful co-worker and Paul saw him that way. Paul treated him that way. He was a constant friend in hard times. Philippians and Colossians... He, Paul includes Timothy's name in writing, and Paul's writing those from prison. Uh, he was a desired comfort near the end of Paul's life when he writes 2 Timothy, and he asked Timothy to come to him quickly. Um, and so just think about this relationship uh, between, between these two men. We don't know the age gap. Uh, there's perhaps as much as 30 years of a difference. That's quite a difference. There's perhaps a 30-year difference between these men. And yet Paul's focus on this man was personal and deliberate. He did not have the mindset that said, well, leaders just naturally develop themselves. He did not have the mindset, well, I'll just kind of I'll just kind of wait. I'll sit back. I'll just kind of watch Timothy, see how and, and if he sort of shows some promise, if he starts going in the right direction, okay, then then maybe I'll kind of bring him in easily. No. Grabbed him, part of it, let's go. You're now you're now part of this work. Do we do that? 
do we do that with individuals? Leadership training has got to be personal and it's got to be delivered. Second thing, leadership training involves using our words. Um, uh, it involved, look in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says, you have carefully followed my doctrine or my teaching. Christianity, leadership training, is not something that happens by osmosis. You have carefully followed my doctrine. If we want men to develop into leaders, then they must hear the truth from our mouths. They must hear uh, sound doctrine, sound instruction coming from our mouths. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul says, The things which you have heard from me, things which you have heard from me. It is not just that Timothy happened to be in the audience when Paul was preaching. I believe that Paul spent time intentionally and, and uh, personally teaching Timothy. If we want men to grow, we need to teach them. They need to hear the truth from us. We don't need just to say, well, you know, we're, we're looking for a new deacon. We're looking for a new elder. Well, you know, this guy's been in the church for 30 years. He, he's, he's probably pretty strong. Are we just, are we just waiting? We, we need to spend time talking to them, teaching them, even one-on-one -on -one having Bible studies or one-on-two or one-on-three, whatever it may be. Not just assuming that they're well. They've been coming to church for a long time. They 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 must they must know. We spent, Paul spent time talking to him one on one. <laughs> I, one, on one. Second, th third thing is deliberate and intentional. Two, you got to use your words. Three, leadership training involve, involves teaching through actions. Look at what Paul says in verse ten. You have carefully followed my doctrine, and what else? Your Bible might say conduct. Your Bible might say manner of life. You, you, have, you have followed not just my words. You've been following what I do. Now look at what he says here. Because it wasn't just that, it wasn't just Paul saying in chapter 2 the things that you have heard from me, and it was just a listening exercise. Look at what he says, and, and this is what men need to see in our lives. This is what Timothy saw in Paul's life. This is what men need to see in our lives. He says, you have carefully followed my purpose. Men need to see, other men in the church, they need to see, those men who are in leadership positions today, they need to see your purpose. Not just figure, well, it must be this. No. They need to see your purpose. They need to know that, uh, that Christianity is not just a Sunday religion to you. They need to know, what is your purpose in life? Look at what else he says. He says, they need to see that you've seen my faith. You've carefully followed my faith. That's what men need to see in us. They need to see our faith. How do we handle trials? And then he has the word patience. You carefully follow my patience. Um, the New King James has the word long suffering. Uh, they need other the men need to see how do we handle mistreatments? How do we handle it when somebody else does us wrong? What is our patience and our long suffering? Like Paul says, you have carefully followed my love. Men need to see our love. They need, what is love? This is agape love. They need to see that we serve selflessly, that we serve sacrificially. It's not about us. Agape love is not about what I receive. It's about what I can give. Paul says, you saw that in me. That's what men need to see in us. The last thing he has in verse 10 is that you've carefully followed my perseverance, my endurance, my steadfastness, your Bible might say. Men need to see that we never falter that we never give up. It doesn't mean that we don't have doubts. It doesn't mean that we don't have trials. It doesn't mean that, that, we don't, that we don't have issues that we deal with in life. We're not perfect. But they need to see that we have been keeping on, keeping on through all of it. So it's not just they need to hear the words, but they need to see in our lives that we are fully committed to Christ. If they don't see that and genuinely see it, not just on Sunday morning see it, genuinely all the time see that in our life, What's going to cause them to want to be leaders in the church? If they're not seeing those qualities in us, when Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, could we say that to somebody and be real about that? They need to hear it in our words. They need to hear it and see it in our actions. And then just leadership training involves men to train others as well. 
So I'm deliberate and I'm intentional. I'm using my words, I'm using my actions, but then I'm looking beyond just this next generation. I'm looking beyond just this next level of leaders, and I'm even looking beyond, what about the ones after that? So it's not just training these men, okay, I hope we can get these men ready, but it's looking beyond them to the next level of leaders. Um, back in 2004, before uh, Brother Winkler passed, we had him down to conduct one of his leadership uh, seminars, and, and I remember him, and I, I wrote some of these things down as he was talking, but he says, he who leads without leading others to lead is no leader. I mean, I, th I mean, Brother Winkler had profound, but he leads without leading others to lead is no leader. He said, success without successors is not success. Uh, and so it's it's looking be uh, not just looking what do we need, not just oh no we're we, you know we've got to get some elders in a hurry. It's looking down the road to say okay what are we doing? And so I find I I don't know if you'll find this interesting. I find it interesting to read this list that Paul has in verse ten here, and to compare it with First Timothy chapter four and verse twelve. We know First Timothy four and verse twelve better than we know this verse because it's the verse we always use in teenage devotionals, right? That we tell the teenagers to not be, to let no one despise your youth, but to be an example. Compare the list here in, in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10 with the list in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. They're almost the same list. Paul says to Timothy, you've carefully followed this in me, but in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12, he said, you need to go and be an example in these same things. What was Paul doing? Trying to train Timothy, but he's training Timothy to go and to train others. So that you've seen in me, you need to emulate so that the others can follow you and you've been following me. Multiple lines of, of progression here. Uh, and then it's not just the things that they have seen, but it's the things that they have heard. And that's where Paul says, 2 Timothy 2, I, I cut short 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, but he says, the things that you have heard in me, commit these two faithful men. Don't just, oh great, I've learned this from Paul. But it's that next line, I have trained you so that you can train others. There's similar wording over in Philippians chapter 4 where Paul tells the church in Philippi, the things which you have learned and received and heard, four verbs, the things you've learned and received and heard and saw and me do. Uh, and, and I believe that those three things about the things that they men see in us, they need to be able to go and train others to do that as well. The things men have heard from us, they need to take that and be able to go and train other men as well. The things that men have received from us and just being around us, they need to be able to go and share those with others as well. And so I find it interesting that this great leader Paul was trying to get Timothy, and you know how much confidence he had in Timothy, trying to get him ready to be a leader in the church, but was looking even beyond him, trying to get that next level of teachers, that next level of leaders uh, in the church. Final thing I want us to think about just on, on this on this thought process, and I want to give you some practical things to consider, is that leadership training must involve putting the men to work. Not just they hear the words, boy, that's really good, I'm glad they said that. Not just that they see something in our lives, good, I'm glad they see, but we've actually got to put them to work. I'm not going to take time to, to look at all these verses uh, for sake of time, but I find it interesting. I, I, I didn't see how many, how often you read from the from the pen of Paul that I urged you, I urged them to do this. I charge you, I charge you. If you look at the word urge, the word charge from the pen of Paul, it's all over the place. What's he doing? He's using his words, encouraging them, saying, I want you to do this. And when leaders come, you know, when, when that little six-year-old boy was told that's the kind of prayer that a preacher prays, that was urging him. That was charging him. He didn't know it. He just... But it's urgent. you need to be a preacher, and it is putting it's rec it's helping them to recognize that they are worth something, and it is helping them to see that you are interested in them. Second thing is not just urging them. We can use our words to urge them, but then we've got to send them. How often do you read about Paul sending different men, especially Timothy? But how often Paul was sending men to do other things? That shows trust, doesn't it? I, I trust you. I need you to go and do this. I can't do it myself, but I need you to go and do it. That's a level of trust, but it also helps that man to know they're trustworthy. That you find trust in them. So urge them with your words and then send them to go and do a task. And then when you have sent them to do a task, leave them. Leave them. 
you know a great you know the greatest way to teach somebody to, to change their own brake pads is, is to go out there show them how to do it and then watch them do it the next time and then back off and go away and leave them alone and if they, because at that point they got to figure out that okay I saw him do it he watched me do it now I've got to do it myself that's what we got to do in, in, in leadership training is Paul says I left you in Crete to Titus Paul why are you leaving me here? I can't do this. I'm, yeah, you can do it on your own. But if I was there, you wouldn't do it. If I was there, you'd be leaning on me to do it. I left you in Crete. I, you, I, he told Timothy, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3, that I, I left you uh, in, in Ephesus, that you remained in Ephesus, that you charged men not to preach any other God. Timothy, I left you. You can do this. Urge them, send them, and then back off. And Could we do it better? If we're the leaders, could we do it better than yeah? And that's that's the difficult. Oh, no, I I've got to do it because I do it right. You know, I do it the right way. I do it, and if I let them do it, they're just they're gonna they're not gonna do it to my level, okay? But they're gonna do it. Uh, and and that's 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 where we, in my mind, when when I just look at these verses from from Paul's pen and from Second Timothy chapter three, those are just some of the things that I see uh, that can be beneficial from a biblical perspective. Uh, for us in, in training leaders. Let me share with you for just a couple minutes. And I, I, I've got my clock up here, so don't worry. Let me share with you just a couple minutes just some practical things from, from a congregation that is trying. This congregation has not perfected leadership training by any stretch of the imagination. And as I said last night, if there's any thoughts that are in here, take them and do them better. Uh, and just just take them to another level. Don't don't try to do them the way that we do them. Do them better because they can be done better. But let me let me share with you just a, a few thoughts about training leaders uh, in a congregation. I think we need to start young, and I think we need to start with our young boys. Um, possibilities. I all the last leaders out here, so you're all involved. Last leaders, good. Use that. Let use that. Especially, I know there's a whole lot of elements in it. Use it to develop the boys to be leaders in the church on different levels because of their different ages. Um, we have we we're not involved in labs. We have what we call uh, his kids. Uh, it's it's similar to what you might have known as pew packers before, but on Sunday Sunday evenings before Sunday evening worship, we have what we call his kids class, and it's for all kids, for all the little kids. But there are times where I really focus on the little boys, uh, and, and and I'm talking three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old little boys and, and just planting these seeds of thought and using them in various ways to take roles of leadership. We, we've had not just the His Kids class on Sunday, but we've had a His Kids camp just a one Saturday in the summer, get all of these kids together, that same age group, about three to nine or so, and it's just a one-day brief camp where we're, we're instilling some some leadership skills, and, and it's, it's simple. What, what am I talking about? I'm talking about these boys leading songs. I'm talking about these boys getting up and reading scripture or quoting scripture. I'm talking about these boys getting up and telling a Bible story. And uh, these boys are nervous. These boys don't want to do it, but they, when they're his kids, they don't have a, they don't have a choice uh, because his, his kids are going to do something. Is what we say. If you don't want to lead a song, then tell, just get up and tell a Bible story. Get up and tell David and Goliath. You know the story. Well, I don't want to. Okay, then here's a verse. Get up and read this verse. Uh, get up and put. But they're all going to do something, uh, and and it's just it's starting them young, and and just trying to develop these 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 not just the skills, but just getting over that that uh, that nervousness, that that idea that I can't do this, I don't want to do this. Uh, this is this is basic and simple, and I'm sure you do something like. But it's just getting little boys involved. Now take that up to the, to teens. Uh, I think we need to focus on our teen boys. If we've been focusing on the little boys, we need to focus on the teen boys. Uh, I believe we need to give teen boys opportunities to to serve and lead and worship as much as every other man in the church. I don't know how things go. Remember, I'm an outsider, but I believe wholeheartedly. That if there is a young man who's been baptized, if there's a 13, 14 year old boy who's been baptized, he is 100% as much a Christian as any other man in that church. Mm -hmm. And so, what part of the worship assembly should he not be a part? Now, I'm not saying he's baptized, we have him up presiding at the Lord's Supper the next Sunday, but he needs to be developed so that he is as much in the rotation of leading worship. And if we're saying, well, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not old enough, they just need to get, well, when is old enough? 
Is it when they've left and they've moved somewhere else and we didn't help to train them because, well, they weren't 18, they weren't 20, they weren't, you know, a season to somebody else. They need opportunities right now, not just in a class, but in an actual worship service. We have, uh, we have our young men conducting our fifth Sunday night services. They, they conduct uh, the entire service. There's one Sunday, sorry, one week every summer uh, where we have a, a leadership training camp. And this is for our teenagers uh, who have been baptized. Uh, who are faithfully attending the church, who are active in the church, and so we've we got some quality qualifications for them to come to this. Uh, but we spend time in leadership training camp one week every every summer, teaching them how to study, teaching them the Bible study tools, a concordance a Bible dictionary, a, a Bible atlas. We teach them um, how to develop lessons, how to prepare the lessons, how to deliver uh, lessons. And the intent of it, we tell them, the intent of it is not for them to get up and speak on Sunday. They do that, and we have a, we even have a ladies' class on Sunday morning for the late, for the young ladies. But the, our focus is not just myopic on Sunday. Our focus is giving them skills and confidence that they can use for the rest of their lives. So focus on the little kids, then focus on the older kids. Focus on the teams. Now we graduate and we talk about what can we do with some of our men. Um, we have we have had periodically uh, a five o'clock Sunday leadership class. Um, it is a uh, just a special class that goes generally from about 10 to 12 weeks uh, on uh, on Sunday evenings, 5 o'clock. Right be- it's right before our evening service, which is at uh, at 6 o'clock. And uh, we just, we study a simple book on, a simple book on church leadership. We have used uh, Wendell Winkler's little book on leadership. Uh, Kirk Brothers has a great book, uh, Lead Like the Lord, I think, uh, is the title of that really good book. Uh, there's another book that uh, is called Rise Up and Build. Who's the guy who wrote that? Neil, <laughs> Neil Pollard, I think is that guy's name. Um, but uh, there, there's, there's a number of books on, that are simple, easy books, but you take those and you break them up and, and then you invite certain men. You send letters to certain men that say, we're having this class. We would really like you to be a part of this class. And this letter is coming from the elders. And don't just include you know, certain men. Okay, we, we're, they're ready to be elders. And include some of the teenage boys. Include some of the college age boys. You're, you're talking about leadership. Why, why not include them and instill some of these concepts and these principles in them? Uh, and then make an announcement to the church. Put it on the church calendar. We're having this leadership class uh, going on and then see who comes. You've invited some specifically. You've you've told everybody that they can come. See who comes. All of a sudden, now you're seeing individuals that are showing an interest that that haven't, and then maybe those become a specialized uh, target, a specialized focus of some of your efforts. Not not the only ones, but this this is a soft way uh, of just introducing leadership concepts to them. Something that we developed a number of years ago is what we call LEAD, L-E-A-D, Leadership, uh, Encouragement, and Development. Uh, and we have part of the LEAD, we call it our long-term protocol. Uh, it sounds fancy, right? But we call it our long-term protocol. This is kind of a, a level one, stage one training program for men uh, that, we, that we use as an intentional, you know, the, the leadership class at five o'clock is for anybody who wants to come. It's wide open. We, we got ladies coming to it. That's, that's great. But the, the lead program is intentional, it's direct, it's a focused training program on specific men. What we have done is, is we identify men that have some good potential uh, in the church for leadership, men who possibly could be elders in five to 15, I mean, I know that's a long range, but, and, and usually it's more like 10 to 15 years. Guys who could probably be elders in the next seven to 15 years. That, that's, that's way out there. But why not do something now to help them to, and instead of waiting? Well, we'll wait 10 years and see where they are. No, no, no. We're not in the waiting, watching, wishing uh, camp. We, we're trying to help them. Now, this is, this is simple, though. Uh, what we do with them is we have two class periods uh, every year. Every calendar year, we'll have two class periods, 4.30 on a Sunday. And uh, what we've been doing over the years is we, we take one qualification of an elder and we study it in that class. Um, now, what qualification, and there's a few, but what qualification is there that every man doesn't have that's in the list of qualifications for elder? So we choose, we, we're just going through the list, we choose one qualification for an elder and we say, here's what this is, here's how we develop it, and here's how it looks like in our lives. Um, and, and then we give them, do I have the books? We give, um, 
We every time that we meet with them, we give them two books. Uh, one of them we call it a reading book. One of them we call it a reference book. Meaning, one of these we're going to give you a book. We think it'd be beneficial for you to read this book, read the whole book. And we're not we're not talking about an encyclopedia. We're most of the time very short books, uh, brotherhood. Uh, books that have been written by men. And then we give them a reference book that, that's not, you read it from cover to cover, but this would be beneficial to have on your shelf. Uh, as, as a Bible class teacher, as a leader in the church, you might want to have this on your shelf to be able to go to the reference uh, periodically. So we're trying to build their library, trying to build uh, the, their knowledge base and in, in, in reading. But these men uh, are uh, identified and then invited to come to these meetings uh, twice a year. Something else that we've been trying to do is hosting an annual uh, elder workshop. Do I have that? Hosting an annual elder workshop. Neil was a part of this, is that this year or last year? Uh, last year. Um, that uh, we have an elder, uh, an elder workshop every May on a Friday night and a Saturday. And um, we invite in a preacher, we invite in a guest speaker to come in and talk about uh, various aspects of church leadership, of being an elder, what is involved in that, what does that look like. Uh, we invite local elderships, so it's not just for us. We invite local elderships to come uh, and to be a part of it if they want to. And we're, we're, we want them to come, but our 98% focus is on us. We're doing it for us. We want to benefit, and that sounds bad, we want to benefit the local congregations, but we're trying to make sure we're developing our men. Uh, and so we have an annual elder workshop and we invite we the men who are invited this this the elder workshop is not something we announce to everybody so five o'clock Sunday class specific men are invited but it's on the church calendar anybody can come the, the long-term protocol lead leadership and encouragement and development only select men in fact this may be the first time Trace has ever heard of it. we we that has never been published we don't announce we don't announce that lead exists uh, it's just something that, we, that we've been doing uh, to help train men. The elder workshop, it goes on our calendar, but no details are there. Uh, it, it, it's, it's generally a special invitation. Uh, a special invitation to select men. Now, it includes the long-term protocol lead, but you'll notice that I've also got short-term protocol because we've got that long-term list of, of lead men, but we also have short-term. We've also got, so you, you understand, you all obviously see the difference. If, if long-term is that level one entry into leadership uh, development, this is kind of level two. This is taking it to a different level uh, than what we're doing. Long-term protocol, we're meeting with those, we're meeting with it, you know, all these guys. Now, I know I'm talking about a lot of stuff here, but the short-term guys, they're in the long-term list, all right? So the long-term list, these guys are on that list. But occasionally, we will look at the long-term list and if there are guys who are closer to perhaps being an elder than others, you know, in our minds, maybe within two to three years of being an elder, we, we will identify two to three of them. We'll identify two to three of them. We're, we're not looking for 10. We're just looking for two or three of them. That we say, these guys have got great potential. They are, they, 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 they're so close to being an elder, they just need a little bit more. We're not, what, we're not waiting, watching, and wishing that they developed a little bit more. We're going to put the, we're going to put the focus on helping them uh, to become uh, what they need to be. And so what we do, we've only done this a couple times. We got this idea, and we've tweaked it to fit us. We got this idea from Glenn Colley uh, at West Huntsville uh, down in Alabama. But we conduct a specialized training class for just those two or three guys. Um, and they come and they meet in this specialized class with all of the elders and all of the preachers. Uh, so you, you've got elders, all of our elders, all of our preachers, and you've got these two or three guys who are coming to be a part uh, of this particular class. Um, and it's going to take us 20 to 25 classes. Uh, we, we've, got, we've got about 20 something topics that we're gonna teach them. Uh, actually, it's not that many, but mo some of them take multiple class periods to teach. So we're, they're going to be in this class, 4.30 on a Sunday afternoon, for 20 to 25 classes. Uh, but it may take us a year, and I'll tell you why it may take us a year to get through all of that. Uh, but they're meeting with the elders and preachers. Let me show you a list, and you don't have to do this. This is just a, a list of what are in those classes. These are the class topics. 
The church is designed to have elders. We teach about the qualifications for elders, responsibilities of elders. We teach about the authority of elders. We teach what the heart of an elder looks like. Uh, being kitchen table, kitchen table elders. I can't remember if that's a Glenn Colley thing, terminology, or a Jerry Barber term, or a Wendell Winkler. I've, I've lost track of who, who that kitchen table, uh, but I love that concept. Uh, we talk about an elder's personal faith, the relationship with deacons and elders, or deacons and preachers, what being an elder at our congregation, some of the, the specifics look like. We talk about the relationship between members and elders. We talk about how do you study and interpret the Bible. We talk about numerous doctrinal issues facing the church. We talk about numerous moral issues facing the church. And then we just talk about various scenarios that elders may face. And it's, that's a long list of things. And it, it, it'll take easy 25, 25 class periods to go through. The reason that it takes us a year, back to this list, the reason it takes us a year is that 100% of the lead guys have to be in the class for us to have the class. If one of them's going to be out of town, we don't have the class. Uh, the class is for them, for those two or three guys. So if one of them is sick, one of them, you know, we just, okay, we don't have a class. Now, if there's an elder or preacher who's not there, well, we still have a class because we've got enough of us to cover. And if, if I was supposed to teach that class and I'm out of town, well, an elder will just bump his class up and teach his class, and I'll teach mine when I come back. Um, but 100%, uh, but all of those guys, they've got to be in every single one of the classes. We do have a couple classes for the wives uh, as well. Now, I'm almost done, all right? I'm almost done. Um, I know this is a lot of stuff. So we have these classes going on, but at the same time, we issue some personal challenges to them. We want you to be in these classes. We want you to learn what, what's going to be presented in these classes, but we also present some personal challenges to them, such as, here are these personal challenges. We want you to read through the Bible every year. We want you to read through the, through the two periodicals that we provide you, and at the time, uh, it was Gospel Advocate and uh, Spiritual Sword the last time we did this. We want you to read the books that we provide. They not only get the long-term lead books, but we give them specific books uh, on eldership and being an elder. So we want you to read these books we give you. We want you to be making visits, whether it be hospital visits, visits to the widows, uh, whatever that may be. We want you to invite people into your home and to be hospitable. We want you to look beyond yourself and your family. Look out for visitors. Look out for the youth. Look out for struggling members. We want you, obviously, to attend every church service. We want you to be involved in our education program. We want you to teach one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, but we want you to give attention to your family. Don't overlook them. And we want you to attend all of these training classes that we're having. That's a lot of ask, right? Um, but what are we doing? We're, 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 not, we're not just training them to, to come in and, and figure out how to unlock the doors and turn on the lights. And we're training these men to become elders. Uh, and so we, we are challenging them. And so before this class takes place, before uh, these classes start, uh, the elders go to these men uh, individually. The, all of the elders will go and visit that man. Once they've identified they want him in the short-term protocol lead, they go to his home, they talk to him and his wife, they say, we've got our eyes on you. We see great potential in you. We believe that one day you could be an effective elder in this congregation. We're going to be starting a class. We're not announcing this. You're the only ones that are going to know about it. We're going to be starting this class on Sundays at 4.30 on whatever date. We would like you to be a part of it. We explain what the class is. We explain all of these personal challenges. We want you to be a part of it. Now, this is not a promise that you're going to be an elder. This is not asking you to be an elder. It's not saying once you've gone through this class, we're going to appoint you as an elder. So, you know, we, we, we put that right up front. It's not an invitation to be an elder, but we want to, we see potential in you and we want to train you in that direction. The other thing the elders do is they spend individual time with these men uh, on their own, going out for coffee, uh, just taking and visiting when the elders go visiting. Uh, and then at the end of that 25 or so classes, uh, the elders will meet and they'll spend time talking about these men, evaluating them. Are they qualified? Are they ready? Uh, are they ready to be appointed? I know that's uh, just a, a uh, fire hose of, uh, of information, but what I want, the reason I wanted to just flood you with all of that is perhaps there's something. And again, you all may be doing something better than this, and I would love to hear about it, because I always want to improve everything that's happened. But if there's any little nugget, any little spark that's in any of this, say, you know, we could do that, but we could do it so much better, great. Uh, because what we're facing right now is a crisis. That Brother Winkler's book, Leadership, the Crisis of Our Time. 
But we can't just say, oh no, we're facing crisis. We've got to do something about it. And we've got to determine that we're going to step up, that we're going to get involved, that we're not just going to sit back and wait for men to train themselves, that we've got a plan, and we're going to work that plan, and we're going to pray, and we're going to ask God's help to do that. I know I'm long in this session. I apologize for that, but I don't apologize for that. So um, we are going to take a break. Uh, and uh, uh, let's pray. Go ahead. Five, five minutes. Let, let's pray together and then take, take a break. Holy Father, we've talked about a lot here today. The most important thing is we've talked about your work on this earth and your church. We recognize it's not our church. We recognize it doesn't belong to us. And we don't have all the answers. Father, we just pray that you would give us wisdom, give us courage, give us compassion and understanding. That we take responsibility that you've given to us and your church to make it what it needs to be and to train men to be leaders of your churches your congregations wherever they are so that your church can continue to thrive to 